Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of our History Channel. I'm here with the teacher, the professor, even though she doesn't like that title. But we are going to be discussing the history of Liberia here in detail. You cannot discuss the entire Liberian history without talking about a different segment, different sector, different tribe, different religion, different peoples that make up what we call Liberia. And today we are privileged to have our professor here. She doesn't like that title, but that's what it is. She's going to be talking to us about something that is very dear to me. As you can see, my outfit, I'm in my <laughs> regalia. I am in my Barca regalia. I am ready to talk Barca, talk about the history of Barca. So we are asking you to share this show. All the Barca people in radio land, in TV land, this is where you need to be for the next hour and a half. Learn about your people. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. And, your <laughs> and I'm willing and I'm ready to learn. So the show today is called, obviously it's on the History Channel here, but we are talking about Barca. Now, we want you to look at, there's a distinction, a difference in the spelling now, from what we are accustomed to Barca, which is B-A-S-S-A, -S -S to now what we call B-A-S-A, the Barca. You got to pronounce it the right way. Saw, S-A-W, just like the way you saw mm -hmm. some in the, the, the past tense of C. So we want to <laughs> add that by saw. That's how you pronounce it. And she's here to, to educate us. And not only the history, but the narrative from 1461 to 1821. That's a long time. Yes. That's a few months before I was born. But it's all right. <laughs> just a so, little bit. You know, uh, I want you to, to be welcome here. I want you to feel comfortable. I want to thank you very much for what you do. And, you know, you, back home, they say when you're talking about somebody, they get upset. But I gave, with Basel people, gave you the right to talk about us. <laughs> uh, in, in conjunction with call, we have Mr. Jabari Lam here. He's our engineer and somebody, young man, who is brilliant. He loves what we do, and he's going to be contributing to it in any way that uh, the professor asked us to do. So, Cole, please introduce yourself real quick, and let's get to this, because I can't wait. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Cole, uh, this is Cole Fambula, and I am so excited about Liberian history. The more I learn, the more pride I get, the more grateful I am to have been born a Liberian Um while it is a burden at times, it is also a blessing. And then, you know, there's no other, there's no other history of any, uh, anywhere <laughs> that I find more fascinating and intriguing than the history of Liberia and her people, her very diverse people. And um, as everyone knows, when I'm talking about Liberian history, uh, and, and if you're a part of Liberia, you're a part of me because I'm Liberian. So when I present on whether it be a president or a merchant or some kind of uh, ancient king, that those are my people. So, you know, today I'm Basa. <laughs> today I'm Basa, so we'll go on from there. But Jabari is here. Um, he helped me do some of the re research for this. He's a very, very good archival researcher. And so um, lately he's been seeing him on the shows because he's been doing a very good job of supporting the research effort there's also other members of the Liberian History Guild that pull things together. Um, so I want to say kudos to everyone that helped with this. And uh, Jabari, you can tell them about yourself <laughs> a little bit in BAIO. Yes. So Jabari, and he's Basa today, too. <laughs> yeah. Basa boy. Basa boy as well. And I'm going to give you a name. Your name is Sonny Guy. Sonny Guy. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm going to use that name for now. Basa, Basa Body, as some call me. <laughs> been on here a couple times. Been studying Liberian history since I was a sophomore, junior in high school. So it's been about six years, six to seven years studying Liberian history from the very beginning to the present day. So I'm part of the BIL. We're an organization dedicated to strengthening the connection between African Americans and Liberia through initiatives in education because Liberia cannot rise without her people at home and abroad. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, before the, before the professor get going, let me let you know uh, right off the bat, 
uh, Mr. Dennis Jai, you should have host the show here. Nobody can replace Mr. Jai what he does. <laughs> I, I'm, only, I'm only He's here. So singing. Valuable. He is the best. He knows what he does. I'm only here to fill it. And I also want to acknowledge the work that these people do. This is babysitting. We're talking about four years of putting your life on the line. These people have families. They got children. They got wives. They need to go to the park. They need to take their children off a venture. They sacrifice all of those for us. 24-7, he's here. So it makes sense that once in a while, some of us will come in and say, you know what? Take your family out <laughs> for a little outing. So whatever mistake, whatever error you see here, we are improvising. I'm here. I am not Dennis Dark. I never feel it. <laughs> uh, Excellent disclaimer. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, another another dis another uh, 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 caveat here is we to keep the lights on here. Uh, these men and women they spend a lot of money from their own pocket. So we are asking you to make a donation. If it's $10 a month, you make that commitment. You multiply that by 12, that would be $120 a year that you are giving to this station. If you want to do it once a, once a year, when your income tax comes, just cut us a check, send it to FOL. We'll do that. In the meantime, FOL has only one sponsor here. It's Kana Cash. If you are sending money to Liberia, please use Kana Cash. CanaCash.com. Now that we have done our house cleaning, Professor, let's get going. What is it about the Basa people that actually interest you, or why did you want to begin with the Basa people when you know very well the Va people are going to come after you, the Pele people are going to come after you? Why the Basa people? <laughs> so, this is not um, um, necessarily about, it's not necessarily about the uh, Basa people, but about the Basa. Um, coast. And it is, it's about both. And let me clarify this. Ethnicity is fluid. And so what I wanted to do was to present these older kings that we don't really hear about in the, in the, in the narrative of, of our history. I am pretty much convinced that because we're going back to the 1500s. So I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that these are people that would be classified as River Sess Basa today. Um, I'm going to do a lot of explaining. And, you know, uh, as we know, the Basa people go by different names depending on where they're located, right? So if you're a Basa from, on the, you know, near the St. John River, you're going to refer to the Basa people along the uh, Sestos, uh, Sest River, what they used to call River Sestos, um, by a different name. And so, or Mamba, if, you, if you're talking about the Mamba people from my Gibi, um, I mean, from Gibi territory. So there's different groups with different names, but one of the beautiful things that I discovered when looking at this is that at one point in time, and you're gonna see evidence of this, it looks like they were all part of a, in a an extended, almost like a kingdom, all under the same umbrella, which is interesting because anthropology has taught us that they never really had a central authority. So we've covered Kingdom Koya, we've covered the vibe, you know, King Peters of Cape Maserato, we've done all of these things. But when you start to look at, you know, the Southeast, they always say, okay, these were clan-based societies. And what anthropologists call clan-based societies are what they call stateless society, meaning they're independent clans and chiefdoms, but they don't have a centralized authority. The story of Basso challenges this. And that blew my mind. So I said, okay, this is something that we need to present and hopefully stir up some interest in. Maybe somebody who's getting a PhD in anthropology who's Liberian can then focus on this particular subject because they need to take this further and really pull everything together. Um, and when I say uh, the, the people have been uh, categorized as clan-based, it's really the Klau or Kwa language family of people, which would include the 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 Kron, which you know a lot of these names of course are names that we call modern the modern ethnic groups, um, and then the 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 what we call crew or crowd people and and Grable or Glable and uh, of course Basa, and this group Basa are the largest group among all of these, contrary to what people think they're the most numerous in population and possibly the most diverse. 
Um, but we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so yes, I think we may be onto something that this was probably a much larger um, uh, extended kingdom than just clan based at this point in history. And there is also evidence of a dynasty of leaders which is contradicting most of everything that I've ever been told about um, the Klau or the Krau um, speaking peoples. Any questions on that? The question that I have just is, is okay. the geographical area. Why so much in uh, around the river Cest area where, where this most likely to arise like Cestos or why exactly in that area? Because that's where we find the dynasty. That's where we find the dynasty. That's where we find a lineage of three kings. And that's what we're going to really talk about here today. And it doesn't mean that this is, so it's also going to describe the, the extent of their territory, which stretched all the way to the St. John River. And then all the way to the Kavala River, which we all know is Grable today. So this is evidence of an acquisition of, of territory and other people as well. Very, very interesting stuff. But uh, that was what the, the travelers described the, the territory as. I also want to say the term historic narration. Can you put up the first, the cover slide, Jabari? Yes. Um, yes it so, too. Okay. okay. So what I wanted to also point out is that the, when he puts up the cover slide is that the term a historic narration, this is really a documented history. So it's going to be different from the oral history that most of us grew up hearing, right? So this is, this is the, what I do is I research written records. So I want to, here's my disclaimer. <laughs> I'm not here to contradict the oral, oral history. I'm just here to present the written records. And I absolutely am, I mean, I'm just taken aback by the written records. I think it's in also the, the sketches and the drawings of these people is powerful extremely powerful and for me it was uplifting but the first thing i wanted to point out i i came up with the spelling ba saw based on conversations with elders who speak the language um the way that the europeans bought the the frenchman barbo spelled uh ba saw was bar b-a-r-s-a-w after speaking with people, they said no. They, and then, Jerome, can you pronounce it correctly for me, please? <laughs> Mr. Gaiman? You're, you're muted, sir. Uh, it's pronounced by Saul. Mm -hmm. So, to me, this is how it should be spelled. One other thing I wanted to point out before I, you know, really. For many years, I've always understood that B-A-S-S-A, -S which it is, it's a Portuguese word, Basa. Basa is definitely a Portuguese word. Basa goes all the way back to the 15th century when the Portuguese were mapping and naming places on the coast. Old Portuguese and current uh, uh, Spanish, Basa means low or low line. So this was like a shallow cove, a shallow coastline. There are a couple of places along the African coast that they refer to as Basa, B-A-S-S-A, -S -S -A, because of their geographic you know, significance. If it was a shallow place, they would call it Basa. Mm -hmm. So I was always under the impression that the Basa people were named after the place as opposed to the other way around. Now, there is, of course, overwhelming evidence that the Portuguese did name the place Basa, Basa Cove, later on called by the, the English-speaking people. But Basa and the Cestos, which means basket in Portuguese, these places, Cape Dumont, which is now Cape Mezzerado, which we mispronounced Montserrado, um, which was originally called Cape Mezzerado. Um, these places were all named by Portuguese. Now, what I do not know um, is whether Basso was naming himself after the place or if it really means Father Rock or Father Stone. So, or, you know, it could be a combination of both because language is funny. Um, to give an example of this, uh, in, in recent colloquia, um, 
African American hip hop music, they'll say, uh, you know, you're balling, B A L L I N G. You're balling, meaning if you're balling, you're rich. You 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 have uh, you have a lot of uh, resources. You you know you basically you're balling because basketball players, football players, those are the people who are balling, meaning that they playing ball, they're making money. Liberians hear this and they say your pot is boiling, B O I L I. <laughs> you know you're boiling. So it's the same thing. They took it, they misheard it, and started saying, oh, man, you boiling, meaning that your pot's boiling. So it's the same concept where you hear something and you give it your own meaning. I don't know if that's what happened or if that was truly his name, Basa. But whatever the case, this is probably, you know, a combination of both. That's something somebody else needs to research. I just needed to point that out. Um, I'm not 100% convinced that he was mispronouncing Bassa and calling himself Bassa. He probably was actually Father Rock. But I want to also believe that this person is who all of these people take this name from. And the oral tradition kind of jives with this a little bit, except they, um, you know. But anyway, also the uh, historic narration from 1461 to 1821, that's 360 years. So we named this presentation Bassa 360. And we are going to stop the presentation before ACS. And the reason we started in 1461 is because that's where the documented record begins. Any questions on this? Yeah, the, uh, the name uh, as pronounced in our lingo is mm -hmm. Basso, that is Mr. Rock. Oh, Mr. Wow. Rock, not Father yeah. Rock. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, the same thing, Mr. or Father Rock. Because okay. when you hear when you hear someone like uh, uh, Abakanga, that means our Father Kanga. Okay. So when you hear ba, the same thing. Aba me our Father. So yes, Baso is Father Rock or Mr. Rock. So you I got love that. It. Okay. So you got that right. Obviously correct. Okay. Perfect. And thank you for the pronunciation. Jump in and correct me. That's not my area. I'm, you know, God has blessed us all with many gifts. Um, I have many blessings. Language is not one of them. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. um, uh, we want to we want to commend you because uh, as in most of our tribal and traditional uh, uh, languages, we have the oral history, but we do not have the written part of it. So yeah. what you what you bring to this discussion is uh, you are bringing the historical context as it is written. Yes. So you, we can reference that. Uh, uh, as you know, oral history passed down by the time it goes like in your classroom. When you, uh, when you, when you yeah, like something. telephone, the, yeah, the, the game telephone. <laughs> right. When you say something by the time it goes around the, the class, by the time it gets to the last kids, the, the whole context has changed. So oral yeah. history has mm -hmm. a way of, of, of delineating the real meaning, but when it's written like you have done, why you are bringing this is why most of us are attentive. We are students. We are listening because you you talk about 1461. I was way way back. So we were yeah. Very so and fun. yeah, the other thing I wanted to um to point out here is that we don't usually have the uh, we don't have dates in our tradition, right? We don't count and number years the same way the Romans did, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody really did until the Romans conquered them. So all of us number dates and years based on Roman tradition. So when Rome conquered Western Europe, they taught them this is this year. And for therefore, they also started counting years. When the children and those who were conquered by Rome, the Western Europeans came to West Africa, this is this year. And so therefore we are also conquering, I'm sorry, counting years. So well, the oral tradition doesn't have dates because it's not our culture. And so that is a little bit of a challenge. What this does is it gives dates and it gives context because things are documented by people who trace things by years, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's very important as well. Um, I want you all to pay a little bit of attention to this photo or this sketch. This was actually sketched. Um, this is a sketch of, of uh, by a French explorer named Barbo in the year 1681. We're going to actually get to this a little bit more as we get further in. But one of the things that really, really struck me in the year 1681 is the, 
attire. Barbo goes to River Sess, what is modern day River Sess, to the River Sessos, and he meets the king, whose name was Ba Saw. And he sketches this um, scene in the Palava. And the only person who has the loincloth tied around him is a soldier around his waist. Most of the traditions of, of, of Liberia, when we talk, not the traditions, but the historians, when they talk about Liberia and the crew coast is what they usually call all of this area. What they normally do is they, they make it look like the people didn't have clothes. They were only wearing these, these loincloths and, you know, this is in the year when 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 uh, Barbo sketches was 1681. The year 1681, the United States was still a British colony. You know, here he comes on the coast to meet with these people to organize trade, and look at the way that they are dressed. I mean, that was for me the biggest surprise. Um, he has a council around him, and they're all wearing gowns. So one thing about Barbo is when he sketched people and sketched situations, his sketches are considered historically accurate. He paid very close attention to detail. When he drew maps, you can go back today and look at those maps and they were pretty accurate. So Barbo was not just fantasizing when he was drawing these things. It's pretty much um, accepted that this is an anthropological gem because you can go back, look at the shapes of the baskets, you know, how they had the chickens, everything else laid out how the, the weaving of the hut, the, the palava hut or the meeting house that they were in, all of these things have anthropological significance. So this is very important to me to share that and point this out to everyone who is listening. Um, there is such a thing of called, uh, uh, well, it's not a nice word, but there's a thing called cultural de degeneration, which means that you can have a series of wars and other catastrophes that destroy people's culture and leave remnants of the old culture behind, but it's not completely intact. This could be a one explanation for why when they came, they didn't see everybody doing things at this level, at this advanced level that they had in the 1600s or 1500s. That by the time 1822 came, things had really, because of these series of rolling wars, deteriorated. We had a very short war, comparatively speaking, extremely short, comparatively speaking. And you see how much devastation and uh, denigration happened to our culture, our way of life, our control over our children and how they behave. And all of these things have kind of just from a, a war that didn't last more than, you know, a couple of decades. So you're talking about rolling wars that lasted for a couple of generations. Um, so those rolling wars really kicked in in the 1700s, but this is before the, this chaos. This is how advanced the civilization was among the people. Very important to point out. Um, any questions on that before we go to the next slide? I'm, 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 I'm enjoying this. <laughs> also, I'm looking at the king's men standing, I mean, like I said, his council mm -hmm. standing behind him and, and tentatively Watching, I want to believe among them have been a scribe at the time. They call them someone who were taking notes and writing and and all of that. So th this is this is very awesome. I'm looking at the, the actual construction of the gazebo or mm -hmm. the palava or the palava hut. When you look at it, you can tell that it, it is neatly touched, like mm -hmm. we like we still do. So this is this is awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. For this. So stand, the ones who were standing there is so it's, it's, it's some of his soldiers that were standing with the um, with the Europeans. Sure. This is also very important. The Europeans are standing and he's seated. So this is not a this this is the year 1681. The slave trade is still going on, mm -hmm. and he's seated in his regal greatness. The Europeans are standing before him. They are not given a seat because they have to recognize his Majesty. And the council is seated around him, almost on their knees, postured. The Europeans are standing, and they are standing with a guard, a, 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 an African guard, guarding them as they stand before the king. So this is a very powerful image. It doesn't show a weak, you know, pitiful, you know, how everybody describes some kind of ignorant savage that, oh, the white people, they see the people coming, oh, big white man, how you doing? No, this is a situation where 
you can see the king in his royal dignity. Barbo is the one sketching this. He's presenting this. So he's not coming in saying, oh, I walked in there and I told the king to come to me. This is stuff that you start seeing much later. Mm -hmm. But in the year 1681, his, his dignity, his regalness is still intact. Europeans are, are, uh, are, are forced to recognize his majesty. Ladies and gentlemen, you are a Basa man or a Basa woman or somebody who has a Basa language, a lineage, this is where you need to be. Uh, if you're I'm, Liberian, period. Yes, yes, if you're because Liberian, come on here and learn about your neighbors, about your brothers, your sisters. Uh, yeah. When we were growing up, uh, the chief used to tell us that every bloodline in the Republic of Liberia has a blood basso strain in their senior. You have a basso blood running down your senior. Now we are getting to find out where that logic came from. If we have connection from basically the entire coast, okay, uh, now they call it a basso belt. If it's that true, that means we are actually all interrelated at some point. I mean, that's what I think they mean when they say there's a bias of blood running everybody in the country. It could be true that we are all one. We start yes. what, what just happened there. Exactly. So culture is not is not necessarily tied to genetics. Ethnicity and culture are fluid. Um, they move with populations, with marriage, with with, with war, and, and populations grow and assimilate and adopt culture and language. So we have to be understand that that's some of this too. And some of the reason you see some of these similarities um, in, in language and culture is, is because of some of the things we just explained. Um, it is a small place and I believe these people, contrary to what a lot of anthropologists have, have assumed, I don't believe based on my research that anybody walked to Liberia speaking the language we recognize as Bassa. These people have been in this place so long, these proud speaking people have been there so long that the language appears to be endemic to the place we call Liberia. Because there's nothing related to it really outside of the Liberia Ivory Coast Belt. Other people who might call themselves Basa and Cameroon, clearly they're not related to the Basa in Liberia. There's a completely different language family, no similarities. Again, the word Basa is Portuguese. Basa, these people, as far as I can see, are endemic and their language evolved right where it is. No group of people marched down thousand miles speaking the language that would be recognized today as Basso. And so these people have been there so long that these cultures and languages, you know, my understanding now, based on my research, is that they are endemic to the area. This is, this is they, they're so old in the place that you can't attribute their cultures to a migration. And, and I wonder, uh, not to cut you off, I, I mean, to buttress what you were saying, uh, uh, all the languages, <laughs> as you know, uh, are evolving and have evolved. For instance, there are new terminologies and things that cell phone, uh, internet that just came on, mm -hmm. and that were, they were there when the, when the languages were there. So right. then we have now incorporated those things. You, you talk to a Basa person, they would tell you to them, phone, but they say, send me phone. Um, <laughs> okay. Data, you say data, I don't have data. So they are telling you that as the language, like you say, as we move on and that we make advances, we incorporate new things and then we evolve. So you are right. Uh, the original language that was spoken now that we have intermarried and, and moved on and have been associated with other folk, uh, their languages and their way of life uh, also right. brought off on us. And when you listen to some of the crowd people speaking, you think they're speaking bad. So when you look at the we people, you look at the crew people, the gribble, we all have those things in common. Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. You're welcome. So at, at this point in history, we're going to go to, this is now, um, Dubar, you can take over this slide. You want you want the next slide? No, yeah, the one you done. Yeah. Okay. Slide Mala, two. Uh, Malagueta, which is Portuguese for the grain coves, or am I right? Malagueta or pepper? I think it's Portuguese for mm -hmm. pepper. Yeah. It's really, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me just clarify this. So the grain coast and the pepper coast have the same boundaries. And yes, Malagueta, they say the peppers were grains of paradise. 
But really, if you look at it, the grain coast really is referring to rice, people buying rice, where the pepper coast is referring to people buying pepper. So once you get a little further west, it's about rice. A little further east, it's about pepper. I want everyone to keep this in mind. So people, pepper was the, the type of melagueta pepper was not, was not farmed. It was harvested. It was wild pepper that was harvested. But rice was farmed. And so what happens is with the European revision narrative of history to justify slavery, trying to erase our agricultural efficiency, that we were actually exporting massive amounts of rice, mass amounts of rice from the coast, they try to say, oh, no, it's the wild pepper we're calling grain, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, all of the rice stations, in fact, many of the people from Liberia and Sierra Leone were taken into slavery because they were master rice farmers and taken to places like South Carolina and the seacoast of Georgia. And they are the ones who came and, and, and started the rice farming in the United States. So there's a lot of um, books written about that, black rice and whatever. So I just want to clarify, Grain Coast referring to the same area pretty much as the Melagueta or Pepper Coast. However, both is about rice and also the, the wild pepper. Go ahead, Jabari. The Malagueta, the Malagueta or the grain or the Pepper Coast, a country of Guinea bound by Sierra Leone, Sierra Leona, which is just Portuguese for Sierra Leone on the west and the Ivory Coast on the southeast, extending about 300 miles long along the Atlantic. It abounds with lemons, oranges, dates, palm wine, and a peculiarly delicious kind of nuts. But its chief article of commerce is pepper. The people are governed by a king whom they hold in great veneration, but they are fond of the Europeans. So this particular um, passage is from the 15th century. So that's the 1400s, late 1400s, so very late 15th century. Um, the area was first mapped by the Portuguese, um, as we've clearly already said, in the year 1461. So this is about 30 years later um, when they've been engaged in trade. And these are some of the articles that they go and, and purchase and procure at this point. Okay. Very interesting. So the map also shows that they knew enough about the interior forest to know that there were elephants there because they were buying ivory. And they would ask where are the elephants and the people would tell them, oh, they're from way in the interior. This is before the year 1500. Um, so they had some idea that there were some mountains that you had to cross if you went inland. So they did the description of the inland territories in this map is not because the Europeans went there, but because the Africans described what was there. And so they made sure they put the elephants there so everybody knew that you could get ivory. So this isn't the, the ivory coast. So you see the red line. So you get over here, it's the ivory coast, but you also had ivory in the on, on, on the pepper coast or the grain coast as well. So that's really important. Um, so our people have been elephant hunters for many, many centuries. Um, you can go to the next slide if you don't have questions. Sure. On that. Real, real quick, before we go to the next slide here, uh, mm -hmm. some, a word caught my attention. Hopefully, I'm not reading too much into it. Uh, the last line I said, but they, they are fond of Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, is it our generosity and our hospitality make us to be so meek that the thing that we are fond of them to our own detriment that? We hold them in such a high esteem that maybe we think, or they think that they feel superior in some. Why would we be so fun of a group of folks when we are when we are the dynasty, we are the king? How could we be so fun of somebody who is a stranger? Well, they didn't say the the king was the one who's fond of the stranger. They said the people are governed by a king whom they hold in great rever uh, veneration, reverence. They they look up to this king, and they said, but they are fond, but they are fond of Europeans. So who are the people that are interacting with the common people? They're not coming there and sitting down with a the king. They had the reason you saw that that uh, Barbo going and sitting and meeting with the king. He wasn't even sitting; was standing. 
You're not, gonna, you're not supposed to sit in the presence of this man. So the people who are the fun, you know, if you're working on the coast, you're a fisherman, a European, so you get to trade. They have things. They have things that you don't have. You have things that they don't have. They come and you find them to be interesting. So I don't think at this point it's necessarily a, a, a servant master thing. It's like, oh, our, you know, our, our friends, our friends have come and they're bringing goods. So this is so long ago. <laughs> they haven't had these incidents of, of, of violence and, 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 uh, and horror yet. Quick side note, a uh, quick side note. Yeah. Um, we're not uh, live on YouTube, just FI. Oh, we're not? That's not good. Is there yeah. a way we can do that, Jerome? Is it too late? Uh, I, uh, Mr. Jabari, you're the, you the engineer. How does that work? Or so, we can do, we can just upload the whole video later, but go ahead. That, that's yeah. correct. Okay, great. So let's go to the I next. I mean, if you're able to do it now so people can catch it, that's fine too. Yeah. But if not, we'll just upload it. Okay. okay great. All right. So basically, um, the trade advantages of each place. Um, you know, I'm sorry, Jabari, you can go ahead. And before you do, this is just a picture from the 19th century, a sketch from the 19th century of a, a, a river sus native. <laughs> so I just thought I'd, po I'd pop that in there since the dynasty we're discussing is from River Sus. Hey, important context. We need more pictures. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and this guy this guy looks like he lives in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> you think you think to be diving in the in the in the Sussex River that small exercise. <laughs> the trade and advantages of each place being elephants, teeth, rice, gold, slaves, corn. And they include Cape Mount, Cape Mount Surata, the River Sestos, Languini. Or Linguino, Bufo, Sino, Wapo, Brancetra, Cape Palmas. And this comes from the calendar of state papers, colonial series, America in the West Indies, 1675 to 1676. And a lot of those sound like where places we have today, Cape Mount. You know, Ground Cape Mount, River Sestos, Sestos, Grand. Cetera, right. I mean, Mount we kept a lot of the Portuguese names. We kept a lot yep. of the Portuguese Grand names. Grand Crew. Mm hmm Cape Palmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, here's one of the things I wanted to point out. The reason this slide is here, even though it's roughly 200 years later, almost 200 years, see the increase of, of, the, of goods that are being sold. So from the previous slide, they don't mention everything that's in this this. So the first one was from the late 1400s. Now we're in the mid to late 1600s. And now you're talking about they're now growing lots of corn, which some people say is, 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 is not indigenous to West Africa, but for, to South America. And now West Africans have mastered agriculture growing corn. So now they can trade corn with the Europeans. Um, uh, now rice, which is cultivated um, in Africa, one of the oldest places in the world to ever cultivate rice is where we're from. So you've got the rice coming from the north um, in the places like Bading and all those areas um, coming down to the coast via the St. John River. And then you've got um, all of these, these increased uh, staples uh, that were not there 200 years ago are now being traded in mass quantity. So where before people were trading, I mean, growing rice just for their consumption, they're now growing rice in mass quantities for trade on the coast. And this is what increases um, the need for labor <laughs> in the Northern Kingdom. So now you're developing stronger central authorities in the rainforest because people are being now put, up, put to work to grow enough rice to export. And then you need people to transport that rice via you know, their bodies basically down to the coast. So this is really, really to compare that increase and in that shift um, increase in commerce over that 200 year period. And now they're, they've added human beings. So 200 years before this, they were not selling people, right? Now mm -hmm. they've added human beings. Yeah. Mm. So this is, uh, so this is what we're going to go into next. This is supposed to be, uh, this is housed at the Brooklyn Museum. It's supposed to be an, uh, a, a 17th century, I'm sorry, 18th century um, from the 1600s. Um, Basaw 
uh, helmets. That's what they said. It looks very much like a Mende Vi helmet to me, but they say it's Vasaw. So this is very, this is a clue. Where are my anthropologists? This is something you can research and see what that connection is. Maybe it's just proximity and cultural, you know, fusion back then. Um, or it could be remnants of Kingdom Koya that we talk about all the time, what we used to talk about in the History Channel. Um, but this is the first and, and the oldest king of this dynasty that we're going to talk about is King Candibia. Candibia is what I was said. Jerome? Yes. Is that how you say Candibia? Yeah. Now, yeah. this is... This is my spelling based on listening to Sei and other Basa speakers and Sei's uncle translating the Kadibia in brackets is what is spelled as by the Europeans. Um, so the people who understand Basa will have the especially the elders who understand Basa have translated this to Kandibia. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Jerome? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So that's what I spelled it this way because that's the way I heard it. So the spelling in the brackets is how the Europeans heard it. The spelling, the other spelling is how Ka hears it. So again, take this <laughs> and understand that this is not my my strength. But you know, that's why I'm asking Jeruma. Anyone else, just put in the comments if you have um a better suggestion of the spelling, but I wanted to spell it phonetically. Kandibia is what I heard. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and, and he, uh, mm -hmm. excuse me, I don't to cut you up. When you when you go to Basa, when you go to the Basa land, mm -hmm. uh, traditionally the elders would when they ask you what part of the Basa you're from, mm -hmm. and you don't know whether a Mamba Basa or Sesto Basa, they say you can tell it by the texture of the of the food they eat. So mm. they if you are in lower Buchanan, the certain part of the basa, your fufu will be soft. <laughs> as we move north, and you, you get and closer you, to Nimba, <laughs> it's getting harder and harder. And then when you when you get with our cousins in the Kokoya area, the Nimba area, all of that, then you 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 now you not run into the GB. So if you want to know what part of the the, the basa land that they hail from, depending on the food they eat, you can tell. And the way to do that is the texture of the fufu. So if you if you met a guy, if you went to visit a basa home and the fufu is kind of soft, that means they are, they are seas, they are they are sea coast, uh, uh people from the coastal area, they're from the ocean, okay. the ocean. And then as they start going upward north in the interior, it start getting harder. They go from fufu to deeper, from deeper to, to do more, so from do more to deeper. How does that how does that relate to the name Kandi Bia? Well, Bia, uh, uh, Bia, from what I understand, Bia is a is, is a is 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 a it, it might have been a very powerful he might have been a very powerful king, because if someone tells you when they mention the word Bia in anything, that means he is that means that person is going is going to come down on you hard, okay? As though the king had imposed a penalty. So if you hear the name Bia, Bia Pando means that if we say this thing, basically if they call this name in, in Barca, in any conversation, that means you are either found guilty or something terrible is going to happen to you. That means this man, the king has spoken. So when you, hear, when you hear that name, it's very, very powerful. And, okay. and, and it's not easily used when it's used, it's used with dignity and strength. That's why when you, when you hear this name, and, and, the, and I don't want to cross over into the, the Sandy or Poro society and all that stuff, but when they say Bia, when they say Bia, when they say yeah. this name in that name, people tremble. So this might have been a very, might have been a very powerful king because if they mention his name, it put fear in everybody. You better straighten up. Yeah. Excellent, 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 excellent. So, 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 yeah, Bia, Bia, and it just also keep in mind that this is the oldest king, the mm -hmm. most ancient king that we are able to trace by the written record, by name. Mm -hmm. There were many before him, clearly, but mm -hmm. that is the oldest king that we're able to trace by record, mm -hmm. by written record. And I will also tell you, Nowhere in the oral tradition does he exist because his name has been forgotten. So as much as we, we, we sometimes, you know, these people wrote the name down 
And this is why we know. Now we can say Kandibia. And we know that this was a giant. Yes. And this is the most ancient giant. The oral tradition stops at Basa, which is his descendant. Mm -hmm. But he is more ancient. Wow. King, and so, go ahead, Jabari. King Kandibia. Did I get the King Kandibia? Mm -hmm. Dibia. You mm -hmm. pronounced it the right way the first time. Kandibia. Oh. Mm -hmm. Kandibia. Right. <laughs> right. And his fathers before him were well accustomed to trading with Europeans. It was the Portuguese who gave the river, the Sestos River, the name. Oh, sorry. That's y'all know I don't edit these slides. I just throw them together. So <laughs> you know what I was trying to say. The Portuguese yeah. gave the, the river Sestos the, the, the name. We've already covered that, but this is important because I got this information from Mapping of the Malaga uh, Malagata Coast, a history of Lower Guinea Coast from 1460 to 1510. Now you do know that this was named in 1461. And from 1460 to 1610, they talk about this little map that's on the right is what this area, um, this is how they you know, mapped it. This is really, really important. Kandibia and his fathers before him. This is a dynasty. This is not about a clan-based, disorderly um, bunch of tribes. As some modern anthropologists describe the crowd speaking people. Yes, it is true that by the, the, the 19th century, that is how they had been scattered. But when Kandi Bia was living, the seat of his crown was what we call river says today and it stretched west and it stretched east so it is very possible that all of those people were within this same kingdom and many liberian historians correctly so it's not saying that they're wrong they say oh no it was a stateless society and you know, the people were clan-based. There's not one group of people that followed one king. It is true. That eventually happens. But this is what was existing before the rolling wars and the slave trade devastated the culture. So we have to understand the way we woke up and saw the world is not how it's always been. Mm -hmm. And war causes cultural amnesia. Cultural amnesia is something that occurs when there's a tradition is disrupted, cut off, and people have to regroup and start again. All right. Beautiful. So I just wanted to, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to point that out. Very yeah. important. Before we go, go to the, before we go to the next slide here, uh, I, I want to thank you for if you listen to. Uh, uh, Miss Fam Mrs. Famula here. This thing takes time, hours and hours and hours and hours <laughs> of putting it together. And and like the folks used to say or still say, if you want to hide something from us, just put it in a book because we don't like to read, we don't like to do research. It's time consuming. So we talk about things on the peripheral politics. Uh, who's this, who's that, it's easier to talk because it's opinion. It's your opinion. Nobody can hold you to it. But when you talk about documented uh, 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 events, uh, things that are written down, history, we are talking about 1461. We're talking about way back. So I want to personally thank you for what you have done and the work that it entails to do this. This is not easy. It's, 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 what we see here, uh, what the folks say, we all like to eat sausages. <laughs> it looks beautiful when it's on the plate, it's decorated, but nobody sees how it is made. Yeah. It takes a lot of work, a lot of uh, ingenuity to get the flavor just right. And make it <laughs> uh, you may not want to see how it is done, but uh, it tastes good when you see it. So this is the end product here. What you are seeing here, Hours and hours of research, cut and paste, you gotta put them in the right order and all of that. So wonderful. thank you for it. But before we go to the next slide, ladies and gentlemen, this is great. Please 
share this show, join the conversation. This is awesome. One of the things that I will encourage you now that she has done, it does for us here, she's telling us how important it is for us to write down our family history. If we don't write them down, somebody's going to write it down for us. <laughs> it cannot be exactly how we live our lives here in the United States. So, yes, let her write or that down. Or it will just completely be forgotten. Go ahead. Go ahead. I know you. Yeah. So, you so yeah. Also, Jabari, you can go ahead with the next slide. Any questions on, I guess not. Okay. Jabari, you can go ahead with the next slide, please. According to the Portuguese explorer Duarte Pacheco Pereira, writing in the early 16th century, 1500s, the name is due to the fact that the Negroes of this country come to the ships to sell pepper, which is very good and very plentiful in baskets and which they do not do elsewhere on the coast where this pepper is sold. Cestos is the Portuguese for basket. These baskets were also used as a unit of measuring quantities of pepper. This was Malagueta pepper. Afra Moma Malagueta or grains of paradise. Yes. Now these are not the baskets. Um, I wasn't able to actually find any uh, image of the actual Malagueta pepper baskets in the archives. Doesn't mean that they don't exist. I just didn't find them. So I just put a couple of fish baskets <laughs> in this thing. So don't think this is a Malagueta pepper basket. I really, really tried to find. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't able to. I hope there's a sketch of it somewhere that I haven't uncovered. Again, that's something other people can do. But this is really important. Um, in the 1500s, uh, you know, this is a, a very powerful um, king. He's trading. He has an area that he controls, which could be multi-ethnic. Multi-ethnic meaning people speaking different languages, different related languages. This shows old presence. This contradicts the narrative that everybody came from somewhere and it was very recent. Because you do not see related languages outside of the area, it means that this is where these languages developed and evolved. How long does it take a distinct language to evolve? It could be over 2,000 years. So this idea that everybody, you know, came with a Kenja and set up shop in Liberia, I think is somewhat of a political position that people want to say we're all immigrants. While we are all Liberians, everyone didn't migrate here. There were definitely some ethnic groups that existed here for since antiquity. And... I believe the crowd speaking people are some of those, of course, we all already know about Kisi and Dei, um, all of those male speaking groups that go into the Balam of Sierra Leone and all these areas. But the, the, these are the people that are from the place. It's, it's obvious if you if you really do the, the work and look into what linguists and anthropologists, how they come up with these conclusions, the crowd speaking ethnic groups and the Dei and Gola also fit that, that description. Um, Let's well, see. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Real quick. Uh, the, their description of our land, they describe it as as paradise. Yeah. Paradise. The food. The food from the place is green of paradise. So I mean, just imagine the invaders, the the Europeans. They are looking at us, and yeah. our, and they say this is paradise. I mean, that, I mean, yes. what, something that I observed there when they use that word "greens" or "paradise." Uh, who are we not to, yeah. not to not to claim our royalties? Exactly. Go ahead, Jabari. The question that I have is: Is there a correlation between those who have been there, let's say, at the, since antiquity, and their geographical location, like those people who are more on the coastline being there in antiquity, and those in the who go further into the interior or, or is there no correlation? So you have intermarriage and interconnections. Um, a, a really good example of this is, is the people that call that we call they provide. So you have the they language, which is unique to the coast. But within the they, 
you have infusion of Mendy culture, huge absorption and infusion of Mendy culture over generations. So the they then appear to be Mendy people because they have in incorporated and absorbed Mendy people over the centuries. But the root of their language is actually closer to Gola. And Gola also somewhat infused some Mendy tenants as well. So when we use this term fluidity of ethnicity, it means that ethnic groups, they, they come together and they merge and form new ones. Nobody marched to Cape Dumont or Waconcos, which is the, the they word for, 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 for Cape Mount. Nobody marched to Waconco speaking they or by as we call it today. Nobody marched there speaking that language. People marched there and met people there speaking an older version of the language and infused their culture into it. That is what the linguistic and anthropological record points to. So the, the oversimplification of things, telling people that, oh, our people marched here from this place. It really, you know, that's the oral story. Yes, because some of our ancestors did march, but it's you march, you meet people, you interact with them. You know, the, the older version of the language gets shifted a little bit. You know, so when you it's, it's not it's not what it seems. You have a, a vi a they man does his uh, DNA. It's gonna have he's gonna have some Fulani ancestry. He's gonna have um, different things because people move around. Wars are fought. Women are taken by force. You know, and and they're wifed and they have children. So our our blood is mixed. And our culture is mixed with other African influences. So there's not some, you know, there's people who say, "Oh, I'm, 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 I'm Basa," but their grandmother was probably Mono or or Pele. It's, 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 there's too much interaction between our groups. So our ethnicities are very fluid. We're very related. This is all of our story, as as Jerome said, the elder told him. This is everybody's story. Next slide, please. So this again is, um, and we're, we're kind of flipping around a bit, but I wanted to point this out, it's very important. But um, this is a map of Festos. Um, this is where Kingstown would have been. Wow. So do you see where you've got Sestros Town? Mm -hmm. I think, I believe that's Fish Town now, right? Is that what we call it now? Yes. And then to the north of that, uh, so you're going up now, the, the Sestros River, you've got um, Old Wooding Place, which was at this time um, just below uh, the Kingstown. Mm -hmm. The fact that they call it this old wedding place, it, 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 it points to British influence, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You see how the ore is sketched? Does that look familiar? Hmm. The, the up in the upper left, uh -huh. this is the type of ores that were used by the people of this place. It, they, this ore looks familiar to me. <laughs> The canoe, the small canoe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then up above Kingstown, you've got the upper town. Yeah. Now, this is interesting. You want to say, but why all these English words? We're going to find out in the next couple of slides. Um, the boats that came into the harbor, if you look to the, so you see where the arrow is pointing to Kingstown. If you cross the mm -hmm. river and you go up to the next set of words, it says, the boats must come about this harbor to take fresh water out of the river, out of Ye River, it says, of course, because this is very old, a very old map, out of Ye River. That's how they used to write English. <laughs> so they're taking, they're taking water from here and they're loading up water and other goods and they because you can't drink ocean water, right? So whenever the ships would come in, they would go all the way up there, get their fresh water, and then leave. Hmm. 
So if they have their barrels to put the water in or whatever, I thought that was very fasc fascinating. And then if you look also this little cape here, Cape de Bastos, Boxos. Mm -hmm. All right. Cape Boxos. And I, I, it makes sense because the river empties into the ocean here. And mm -hmm. obviously at the entry point it will be salty. Mm -hmm. and, and as you move, if you actually want to salt water, according to this to this map, you have to come fresh all the way water. up here to get rear to get rear fresh water. Everything else down here would be it would be uh, it will uh, be uh, tainted. Yeah, yeah it'll be tainted. So they're telling you that you gotta pass Kingstown, you gotta go all the way up here to get the water. Mm. So this is before the year 1600. Mm -hmm. You got people going up and down here, European ships going up and down this river, interacting with people, you know. So this idea that we're all sitting down, we know anything about outsiders until 1822, it is officially debunked. <laughs> <laughs> the, ne the next slide, please. Um, so this one again, this is called call on an ambitious spelling rule. Mm -hmm. And after speaking with, of course, consulting people of the Basa language, the Basa language. So the, the in brackets, in brackets, um, this is King or the Prince, and then he became King Dederi Jaqua, mm -hmm. is what they said his name was. We don't mm -hmm. have the letter R. Brr in our languages. So we know it wasn't dead or we. We would have had dead the we. We would have said dead the we yaqua. Dead we yaqua. So not dead or we jaqua, but dead or we yaqua. Because we don't have J either. I know we don't have the letter J because my brother Junior is referred to by my great grandmother as Zion. <laughs> or was when she was still alive. Zion, come here. So we don't have that letter J in our languages, nor the letter R as in Robert, but we do have King Dedawi Yaqua. Yaqua. And what does that mean, Jerome? Well, Ya means to bring, mm -hmm. and Kwa means fist, or a ball of fist. Bring your fist, hmm. uh, whatever that means. But if this king uh, was as powerful as he was, and when you're talking about if you are coming, maybe you are coming to face this, whoever this person is, you better come prepared. Bring your fists. Okay? <laughs> I mean, literally, that's what it means. If you're coming to fight, you better come. If you're coming to take him or conquer his town, you better come ready to fight. Yakua. Bring yeah. your fist. That's what that means. Literally, in Barca. So if you're coming to my town to take my men, my women, my cattle, Whatever it is you're coming, you better come prepare. So this so that, yeah. is powerful. That's why that could have been. So that Dedawi Yakwa is a king that 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 comes much later. So I'm focusing on these kings because these are people who have been lost in the oral tradition. Fortunately, these languages haven't disappeared, so we can take the written record talk to modern day language speakers and say, what is this? And then they will translate. And then I will use my my ability to, to master or not so much master, muster is probably a better word, muster up some phonetic spelling of the modern pronunciation. So now we have Dedewi Yakwa. Um, again, this is based on the Dedewi Jaqua, which we know is not is not um, lingo. It's not in the African lingo phone to, to, to have those letters. Um, so the next, the next uh, um, slide, please. King Dedewi, King Dedaway, is that right? King Dedewi. Oui. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Look at blind leading blind. I'm here telling Jabari how to pronounce stuff. Right. <laughs> I need, I, I'm Basa. I'm Basa. I, I'm, yeah, I'm telling Basa how to pronounce stuff. Go ahead. Oh, Dedewi, Yaqua. 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 The modern day town of Riverses, southeast of Monrovia, Liberia, in between the states now known as Liberian Ivory Coast. Well, because um, I'm assuming, because 
um, Candibia's, Candibia's kingdom stretched along the coast from the St. John Rivers to Crow, close to the present day town of Crew. Oh, whoopsie. Hold on, what's my name? Setra Crew. Setra Crew. Yeah. So, some push his territory all the way to Sierra Leone. Um, some stop it at the St. John River. I just put everything out there because none is more credible than the other because um, the idea of, of, of Sierra Leone uh, coming in before there was such a place called Liberia, right? So you're talking about a time when the word Liberia had never been spoken and there was no place called the United States of America yet. And so, you know, it was just British colonies and and, 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 and whatnot. So it's important to know that um, and speaking that's of this, what, yeah, and speaking the context. 1591, 1591, this was even before the first British colonies. We're talking about uh, Spanish explorers just coming in. You have Samuel de Champlain. Right, it's before 1619, in. exactly. So, this is actually what would have been more accurate was for to just say the Guinea Coast because mm -hmm. that's really what it was called the Guinea Coast. So this whole Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea used to all just be called the Guinea Coast. Mm -hmm. So all of us, we, the, the Sierra Leone came later, Liberia came later. It was all really just the Guinea Coast. It was the Guinea Coast before it was even called the Malaguata Coast. Really, it was the Guinea Coast first. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And um, that's, Go ahead. And the meaning of Guinea, because importance, because some people not know know what Guinea means. Mm -hmm. uh, Guinea means usually referring to black people. It just means that's what it means. Black coast. Yeah. And so the next slide, please. The coastline was flat and heavily wooded, as were the river's banks. On both sides, it is set very pleasantly with trees, very large and very tall. The narrow entrance to the river was marked by a ledge of rocks to the southeast and another large rock in the haven's mouth right as you enter. The king and his subjects were the most southern of the crew people, known as Zewebos. Correct my pronunciation, Zewebos? Mm -hmm. They spoke a variant language called Kwa, in which the people, Bo, addressed their leader as Dabo, the small village where Candibia and his family lived were surrounded by palm and banana and banana trees and situated just a few miles up the river Sestos. So here we have evidence of multi-ethnic, not really ethnic because everybody is like Fa language family, but I'm seeing here Dabo, all of these words are found in that whole language family. What I don't know is if these were separate languages at the time or just separate dialects of the same languages. And as now we're in the 21st century or even from the 20th century, even in the 19th century, at that time they had actually separated each other because of the collapse of the kingdom. And then their languages became less understandable to each other is what my, I'm theorized, um, you know, that's my theory, that's my hypothesis, and it's not etched in stone. But what this implies to me is that the diversity in the language po probably occurred as a result of isolation from each other when things fell apart and these kingdoms fell, or this kingdom fell, and people went to different places. Another possibility is that they are all separate languages, but because they're all under the same umbrella, they started to speak more similarly to each other. So those are the two possibilities. Um, but to me, it's showing that these different people were all within this vicinity and they were all under Kadibia. So it is possible that Grebo or Crown or, or, or Fru, Basa, all these people can say we are descendants of King Kadibia. Hmm. It's very possible that all of them can say this because this is so long ago that this could be the root that connects everybody. It's possible. Excellent. And, and the word Dabo, uh, mm -hmm. when you hear uh, most of the food refer to 
uh, my Ellen, uh, yeah. Ellen is 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 a word of endearment that would mean grandma, or uh, somebody that is endeared on, because uh, most of the the, the, the Basel tribe, they were not patriarchal at all time. People would tell you that uh, we were matriarchal. I mean, we we use our mother language. We came down our mother language. My my grandfather and my grand uncle were named after their mothers. Okay, uh, it was the Western people that came later on, and then we started naming our children after our father. But all my father, my grandfather, my great grand uncle, they were all named their mothers. They were named after their mother. Uh, my my grand uncle name is Bob Johnny. Uh, their mother was born news in the Basa language, so he knew what Bob Johnny that me. Uh, the son of Bon, the son of this woman, that's what it was. Uh, the father was never in the place. The name was never, so we were never patriarchal. They was always uh, matriarchal in that land. And the children were yeah. named, they asked it, who is this child? They said, oh, this is John, the son of Paul. Uh, this is uh, Jabari, the son of Mary. Yeah. They have never, they have never said Jabari Lamb or Jabari Johnson. It's always been the show thing is if this is the son of how then he is who he is. Because mm -hmm. you know uh, there's no hundred percent. There were no DNA to show that I'm my father's son, but there is a proof that I'm my mother's son. <laughs> <laughs> mother's baby, daddy's baby, right? That's all right. So our name so double me is an endearment for our grandma, somebody that we, we uh, okay. so it makes sense to if the land was that was diverse, was thing for them and diverse, and that it gave birth to all of these people, then it makes sense that it did that name uh translate. Yeah, that whether they were separate before and were under the umbrella, the bottom line is this is evidence that we're all under the same umbrella at once. So, this okay. idea of statelessness. Is something that occurred after this period. Excellent, 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 excellent. Wow. And it's, you know, statelessness, we experience it for a brief moment in our lifetimes. That's correct. <laughs> so it's not one. difficult to dismantle a central authority and everybody just runs around crazy for a while. But, you know, so it's understandable. So just remember, statelessness is not antiquity, it is really relatively modern. It's a result of a catastrophic event. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, Jabari. Yeah, it's up. He was baptized in the year 1611 and given the name John after John Davis, the merchant who brought him to London. <laughs> There's supposed to be a letter T at the end of that word. Okay. So <laughs> y'all forgive me. I, I don't edit. I don't sometimes have time to even go through. And sometimes I just put these together literally before the show from my notes, my, you know, so, um, and all of these masks that I'm showing, by the way, are in, in, in sculptures are all supposed to be Basa art from various museums that I just wanted to share since we're celebrating this era. So these are things that are supposed to be coming from the, the, the vicinity, um, from different centuries. Some of them are 20th century, some of them are as old as the 17th century. So, um, And before you go in depth with this, I would just like to uh, elaborate and explain that this is a prime example uh, of, of, of the time period, and it's something that's going to go for future centuries to come. When Europeans come, they're coming obviously for economic gold, like they give you the four gold, uh, like guns, God, and glory, like something like that, those three Gs. Of course, one of them is God. So they're trying to spread Christianity. And so when they're baptized, they're given usually Christian names or, or what we call Western names. King John, as you see here, another infamous example is Queen Nzinga. When she's baptized and she's converted to Christianity, she becomes Anna. So this is this is something to consider at the time. Yeah. So this is this is uh, uh, this man going to London on a merchant ship. One of the the, the merchants who was his father's trading partner. He goes for two reasons. Uh, his father wants him to learn the language of the Europeans more proficient and efficiently so that he can better negotiate. He can have a translator that he trusts. 
And the other reason, the Europeans also like to take African noblemen to Europe, mostly to Liverpool, where there was a school where a lot of them were then taught English. And of course, education in the Western sense comes along with being baptized and Christianized. So he goes, he learns the language at his father's request. Go off, go to school, learn their ways and come home. This is in the year 1611. This is 210 years before ACS sends the first ship to the <laughs> west coast of Africa. This is the year 1611, 210 years before the Elizabeth goes to the west coast of Africa. And this is a leader, a part of a long dynasty from Riverses. There are also leaders at places like Maserato, Cape Maserato and Cape Dumont who have also over the centuries been taken to Liverpool to study. King Peter Brumley, who is one of them. That's very important. We're gonna do a different show about that, but right now we're focusing on this particular dynasty. Hmm. No wonder we got two minutes, John Davis, Gene Davis running around in Grand Bassa County. <laughs> Everywhere there's a Davis. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. It's a very old name. And yes. so people say things like, you know, how this person got Western name if the person is Bassa? Oh, this he must have come on from a ship. He must have come from this ship. You know, and it's like you if you really under they came and met people reading and writing and speaking English. Very, very important to understand that everybody on the coast was not completely illiterate. This is 210 years. Some of the the ancestors of our presidents had not been sold into slavery yet when this was happening in the year 1611. Daniel Bashir Warner's forefathers had not been in America yet. Stephen Allen Benson's forefathers were not in America in the 1600s. In fact, nobody's ancestors were in America because the very first Africans arrived in 1619. So all of the ancestors of the repatriated African Americans were still African at this point. This is how long ago this was. Next slide, please. Father, the English have arrived. King Kandibia smiled at his son. Yes, I know. Go to them, entertain them, and perhaps we will we will get what we want. Prince Dedaway Yakwa put on his cap and set off down river in his canoe with a handful of his men to greet the visitors. The English, sweating in their linen and hose, took them aboard their ship and received their gifts of fruit, rice, ivory, tusk, and grains of paradise. So what did Kadibia want from them? He wanted guns and ammunition. He wanted gunpowder, he wanted to have, you know, fuel his muskets, and he wanted powder. This was a new thing. This was a new thing. And I'm not talking about modern guns. It was a new thing to you know have this technology in this year. The musket. The musket. Okay. This is what he wanted. And so he's sending his son, carry them gifts. You know, this is a lot of stuff. You know, rice, they you know, they on these ships, they need dry grain so that they can survive. You're giving them ivory, extremely valuable in Europe. You're giving them these gifts because there's something that he wants. He wants that powerful fire stick that he can use to shake fear and you know into his enemies. So the son's got to go negotiate for this because he sees that this is the the future. This is power, and you know they know about muskets and they want they want this power. So go on board and go negotiate. So he goes on board. And next slide, please. And this is supposed to be a hoy, but you know, <laughs> a koi. Uh -huh. 
Akoy, yeah, one of the merchants. Aquio is actually, I think, I'm sorry. Aquio is actually how the, the Portuguese would have been greeting people along the coast. So the English used those words as well because mm -hmm. they thought the Africans were more familiar with Portuguese. You can continue. Akio, uh, is that right? Akio mm -hmm. began one mm -hmm. of the merchants before resorting to English, spoken in a slow and deliberate tone of a man not sure if he would be understood. My name is Edward Blythe. I'm a merchant of the East India Company. We have stopped here to refresh ourselves on our long journey to the Spice Islands of the East. The prince smiled and held out his hand. Hello, Mr. Blythman. I am John Davis. The Englishman gapped on hearing his mother tongue fluently spoken and seeing the hand pre-offered in greeting as it was at home. So he now come back and he joined Davis. <laughs> he queen <laughs> out. <laughs> he said, yeah, daddy, I'll go greet the Englishman. Because that was the whole reason his father sent him. And so now he wins favor because now he can talk with them. So his father's plan to send him to go study, it works. He comes back. And of course, now you've got the English coming. And mind you, the English have snuffed out the Dutch along the African coast. They've snuffed out the Dutch. They've snuffed out the Portuguese. The English are becoming extremely powerful. So the old trading partners, the French, the English are now becoming the new, the new, uh, what do you call it? The dead weight on the block. <laughs> They're the new big boys on the block. So he, his father's foresight in having him go to Liverpool and learn English was really smart. If you think about what this is, you know, the year 16, you know, this is in the, the, the 17th century, in the 1600s, the early 1600s, he had the foresight to know that English was going to become a trade language. He probably didn't know that, but he knew that this was an important language. And besides that, the English themselves wanted their language to be dominant. So they had a habit of educating people in their mother tongue, whereas the Portuguese were more assimilationist. They would settle on the coast, have children with the people much more frequently. So a lot of our pigeon along West Africa is mixed with Portuguese. But in this particular, particular case, the English had a school in Liverpool dedicated to educating Africans, African nobility. Next. Mm. Uh, real quick before you go, uh, mm -hmm. the Englishman gapped on hearing his mother tongue fluently <laughs> spoken and seeing the hand proper ingredient as it was done at home. Can you believe the Englishman hears an African speaking in the English language fluently? He didn't say broken, he said fluently. Yeah. The it's the fluency found, that, yeah. As, as it was spoken back at home at, in Liverpool, as you said, they were mm -hmm. educated in Liverpool. Before we move on, uh, the next thing is, uh, is there any similarity here between what the Chinese are now doing, giving all these scholarships to children from Liberia to go to uh, China, and they are learning the Chinese language? Is, it, uh, is history repeating itself here? Well, this is the people who study history master the world. They master the present, and they 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 uh, shape the future. The people who study history master the present and shape the future. People who think history is not important are going to be the objects of subjugation tomorrow. Everyone in this world focuses on history to find their way forward. It is only us, those subjugated Africans, who think history is unimportant. And this is an extremely dangerous mindset to have. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are students of history. There's two things the Chinese do. They study vigorously for millennia their history and they document it and they instill it in their children. The second thing the Chinese do is they study everybody else's history and learn what they did right and what they did wrong and so they can do it better. Mm -hmm. It is only Liberians that think they can succeed by beginning at the present moment. It is a foolish disposition. And we have to encourage our people to look back at the past under because you cannot even interpret the present without the context of history. You won't even understand what's happening today if you don't have a historic context. When you go to the doctor, the first thing they ask you, 
to document or present to them is your medical history so they can properly diagnose your, your problem, your ailment. In order for us to understand our current circumstances and properly diagnose what's challenging us, we have to look at our history. And then we'll have a proper diagnosis and we'll be able to solve it. But if we don't look back, we're gonna misdiagnose the problem and it will not get solved. Next slide, please. The prince smiled again in a welcoming fashion, but privately enjoyed the band's dis discomfiture and amazement. I spent two years in London, sir, with Mr. Davis at the stocks. Davis? The haberdasher? The guinea merchant? Well, that explains why your English is so good. He taught me well, replied the prince. Now, my good sir, your general must come ashore and meet my father. The king looks forward to welcoming you after your long journey. Yes. Wow. So he was brilliant. I mean, there's, I didn't want to put like all of the excerpts from all of the accounts um, in the slideshow. It would be very boring. But one of the things I want to tell you is that when he was studying, when he was being baptized, and he had only been in London for a few months, he recited the Lord's Prayer. He recited the Lord's Prayer fluently in English, where it was understandable. He had only been there for a short period of time. So he was very smart. His father probably chose him for a reason to go. I mean, he picked all of this up, um, not only learning English, but also becoming literate. Um, next slide, please. Dedoe Yaqua, Dedoe Yaqua, about the age of 20, the son of Candibia, king of the river of Cetras or Cestos, Cestus in the country of Guinea, who was sent out of his country by his father in an English ship called the Abigail of London, belonging to Mr. John Davis of this parish to be baptized at the request of the said Mr. Davis and at the desire of the said Dedoe, Dedoe, and by allowance of authority, he was, by the parson of this church, the 1st of January, baptized and named John. His sureties were John Davis, Haberdasher, Isaac Kilburn, Mercer, Robert Singleton, Church Warden, Edmund Towers, Paul, Paul Georgini, and Rebecca Hutchins. He showed his opinion concerning Jesus Christ and his faith in him. He repeated the Lord's player in English at the, sorry, at the From, uh, font, at the font and the and sign with the sign of the cross. Is that right? Okay, so he, he um. He sort of likes Lord's Prayer at the font and so was baptized and signed uh, with the sign of the cross. That's what that means. So, you know, the air cross that, that um, the Anglican and the Catholic Church do. So this is a, a excerpt from Black Two Doors, which is a great book. Um, the Untold Story by Kaufman, uh, Miranda Kaufman. This was published in 2017. So this is one of the, the um, choices for information on, 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 on uh, did uh, way. Um, uh, um, <laughs> I'm so sleepy. I'm sorry, y'all. So this is one of the sources. And what, what, what I love about her is that I was able to then find her sources and go back and check those and get even more information for what we're doing. So um, this is a very good book if you want to um, purchase that. I'm sure it's available on Amazon. And next slide, please. Any questions on that before we go to the next slide? No, beautiful, beautiful. I'm, I'm okay. having a great well time. Okay, thank you. Next slide. King Peter Basa. King so Basa. now we've, we've gone over two kings in this dynasty. I think Peter Basa is the son of I think he's 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 uh, Dedoe's son, John Davis's son. That's what I think. Now, Cape Maserato has a dynasty of King Peters. Is it possible that John Davis 
had a child with one of the daughters of the King Peter of Maserato, because right around this time, there were also King Peters of Cape Maserato. Or is King Peter Basa the father of the King Peters at Maserato? This is something I don't know the answer to. I just wanted to let you know that there's also a dynasty of King Peters that comes after King Peter Basa all the way up until King Peter Bromley that is met in 1821. Any questions on that? No, no, no this is beautiful. Uh, uh, real quick before you move forward, mm -hmm. uh, the word uh, haberdasher keep coming up over and over. Maybe people want to know what that is. In it's a person English, who sews. Right. Mm -hmm. In old English terms, uh, if you find a clothing, uh, a man who makes clothing from scratch, like we do back home, mm -hmm. uh, when you go to the shop, they measure you and sew your clothes exactly. They have everything. They got a needle, they, they uh, the, the buttons, they have everything there. That what uh, happened to Asha in, in old yeah. England. You know, it kept coming up and I wanted our folks to know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. That's a good point and everybody knows what that is. So next slide, please. Jean, Jean Barba noted that the king of Sestos, whom he called Barça, also used the name Peter, for it was customary with the people of nobility on this coast to take European to take a European name. King Peter Barça, or King Peter Barça, was described by Barbo as an old man of 65 or 66 in 1681, so he could have been a son of Didawi Yaqua, born a, a few years ago after his return from London. Yeah, so he, he could have been. I don't know that, right? Mm -hmm. So this again, when I say things like could, I want you all to know that this is just based on what I'm looking. There's nowhere that it says that this is his son, but it's Spence. the same place. It's the same place and generationally, it could be a son or his grandson, but it's the same place. And Bar uh, Barbo comes in contact with, 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 with Basa, who is in the oral tradition, but his father and grandfather are not, um, or great or grandfather and great grandfather are not. Um, but what's really I, I find fascinating here is that Barbo, we talked about this a little bit before, sketched him. So this is a exact this is an excerpt um, from Kaufman's book. It says Barbo sketch uh, of of his meeting with King, what she calls Barsa, and Barbo called Barsa as well. Barbo is is a French. Um, Jean Barbo was a French uh, merchant and, and and traveler, explorer. Um, Peter of Riverses, so King Peter Barsa of Riverses, and this sketch was done around eighteen. I'm um, sorry, sixteen eighty one, the year sixteen eighty one. And there's some hens there in the basket. You see one of them, they're tied, you know, their feet are tied. One of them kind of hanging out the side of the basket. Mm -hmm. um, shortly afterward, they, they, uh, uh, Barbo, in his account, which is in French, um, explained how those hens were then cooked. Barbo describes this scene brilliantly. He goes on to talk about more details about the culture and the people. He describes the women, how liberated these women were. And how they were, you know, uh, basically he was just impressed by the fact that these women didn't have to ask, you know, permission to do things. They could just make choices on their own. And this took, Bar you know, Barbo coming from repressed Western Europe, where women, you know, were basically, uh, uh, you know, trinkets, properties of their husband, going to mm -hmm. this coast and seeing that women had self-determination was something he felt the need to document back in the 1600s, that these women were able to make decisions for themselves. Um, so he, he then signed a trading agreement with the with, with, with King Barbo, Barsa. So what we'll probably do um, is, so I, I, there's more that goes all the way up to 1821, and maybe we'll do like a part two for that because it's getting late. Um, so the next slide we're going to do, I just want to show you all something. So around 1684, um, just to show this exchange of human beings from the Grain Coast, now we're getting into the slavery years where people are being sold. So 
So one of the gifts or some of the gifts that people would give and not even sell would be children, human children as gifts to the royalty. And oh, take this child as a gift to your queen. This person will be a servant. And the same thing happened even in the African context. So they're giving people as gifts. Um, so this is a, a portrait, the only portrait I could find of an actual child from Riverside. And this is a portrait that was done, commissioned around 1684 of an enslaved child from River Sestos who served as a servant to Louise de Cariel, Duchess of Portsmouth. She was the mistress of King Charles II. Mm. And if wow. you see, she has these Asiatic features. Um, I, and, you know, the curly hair, I'm like, this woman looks like she had all kinds of genetic stuff going on, or she could have just been Asian and curled her hair. Um, Asian and European, but this is a child from River Sestos uh, holding a shell filled with pearls. Now, this is very important. River Sestos, the divers and the, 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 the people of River Sestos, the Basa people of River Sestos used to be called fishmen because they used to dive for pearls. They used to put the fish baskets in the water. They were, they were able to go in the water, out of the water, I mean, they, I, I don't know what, I forgot, one of the papes was telling me in the oral tradition that the people of River Sess were called something like the river people or the people under the water or something like that. Does that sound right, uh, Mr. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, ri the river lepers, yeah. Niji. The river lepers or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. So these people were very good at diving for pearls and pearls were almost as important as gold. I mean, they were very important. So. I mean, this was jewelry, well, I wouldn't say gold, but as ivory, right? So they brought a bunch of these people into slavery and they would be diving for pearls. So one of the signatures of people from this area is pearls because these were the pearl divers of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of, of England. Um, and this little girl is holding in her hand a shell full of pearls to mark where she's from as well. And she's wearing a string of pearls around her neck. Hmm. And she uh, is a royal servant. So though she is not free, she is treated with absolute privilege. She's a, um, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dichotomy because she is going to be educated well. She's going to be raised among nobility. She is going to be treated in a culture to behave and conduct herself like a European. However, um, she's not liberated. She's more treated as a pet or an anomaly. So it is a horrible thing. People always say, oh, these children were so lucky to be, you know, basically the lap dogs of these powerful um, duchesses and, and, and queens of Europe. Uh, Queen Elizabeth also had this, you know, uh, situation going on. So it, it, it's not something I, I in, in 2023, want to say was a good thing. Mm -mm. This wow. child was better off as a full-blooded, you know, full-fledged human being where she came from, being free to marry, you know, and, and live her life without, without, you know, you know, there's, you, you can love a child and you can love your pet. And it's not the same thing. Well, uh, Even though people uh, try to argue it is, it really is not the same thing. Okay, uh, yeah. real quick before you, you move, move on here. Uh, I know two years ago, I took uh, some professors from uh, the Florida Atlantic University, University of Florida, and we were in deep Grand Bassa, and they had this huge ceremony, welcome ceremony for us. And when they called the Parama chief, the chief came out, this beautiful woman stood up to greet us. And, and all of my guests, were shot that in Basel land, the Parma chief is a woman. And then and then the the, <laughs> some, the, the MC in Basel, the choir, the bar, he's the guy who actually the town crier mm -hmm. educated, educated all these PhDs. <laughs> that Basa is one of the uh, maybe few or uh, many tribes in Africa where uh women have always been leaders, they've been free. When you talk about women being free, they've been liberated, uh, yes, 
we can we can attest to that. And I'm talking about just two years ago when I took all the PhDs from here and went home, they were shocked to have noticed that the, the, the Panama chief, the chief, and her name was Deso, D-E-S-O, not in Basa, very close to the Nima Bond County uh, mm. Junction. She came out elegantly greeting the folks, and everybody was in, in awe. Yeah, their, their their PhDs were definitely not in anthropology because anthropologists know that we are traditionally matriarchal in, in most of Africa, actually. And anthropologists also know that the reason matriarchy has been replaced by patriarchy is because of Abraham, Abrahamian religious influence through Islam and Christianity. But traditionally, those people that were there would have PhDs in other things other than anthropology because they would they would know that. Um, it is it is us in modern times, we have a, I always make this comparison and I say maybe a hundred years ago, I mean, from now, you will not be able to convince people that getting married in white dress is not African culture. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to convince people that, oh, this is something that we borrowed. There's a lot of things that we do that are borrowed, not from other Africans, but through conquests, first by the Asiatic people, the Arabs who came in with, with their conquest through the, the, the trans-Sahara uh, slave trade, which preceded the transatlantic slave trade, conquering the Northern kingdoms, conquering the Northern people. People start to adopt the culture and start to impose it. Even our Muslim ethnic groups in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea are traditionally matriarchal. They are now patriarchal, but if you really look like at the Madinka culture, they get their names from their mother's clan, not their father's clan. So they have somehow been able to merge the two and you know reconcile it. But before Islam, Mandinka people were very matriarchal. Same thing with all of the Mendi ethnic groups. Uh, so yes, this influence of patriarchy is very, very, in the long scheme of our history, it's very recent. It's an adaptation. Excellent, excellent. And, and, and just before we move on, I know we, we're going to close here. So, uh, this tradition of sending uh, children, uh, maybe not as gift, but uh, children from uh, the the rural area to your nephews or cousins or somebody of of wealth of means, and say, you know, take my child, let my child live with you, and basically there will be a, a domestic servant, send, just send them to school and all of that. It, it is not, uh, I mean, this is still going on. Yeah. In this particular case, it would not have been a actual uh, gift of his own child. So King Peter Basa would not have given his own child. He would have given a slave child or a child that may have otherwise come from a lower class family as a gift. You know, I'm selling you these human beings because his predecessors is not evidence, really strong evidence that they were selling human beings, but there is evidence that he was selling human beings. So things are changing. Excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you are just coming to the show. We want to thank you. This is history. One one in gold. Gold plated. This is awesome. We've been here going on two hours and we're going to, we're going to be bringing yeah. it to a close. But we want to appreciate what this woman have done and continue to do free of charge. Yeah. So we are asking you, enjoy what we are doing here. And I'm sounding more like a, a national public radio now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so a public, yeah. A public broadcasting. If you like the music and you like the performance, if you like this education and you would like it to continue, we are asking you to make a contribution to uh, FOL in any way you can. Every little yeah. dollar, every other contribution will help. Literally, you've been seeing we are covering uh, events in Liberia, uh, education, history, yeah. news. Uh, we are going into the interiors. Uh, they got the motorbikes, they need gasoline, they need helmets, uh, they need data. All of these things cost money. So yeah. we just don't want to be enjoying the show without making a, a meaningful contribution, no matter how little it is. Right, Make right. To FOL, great show. This is not where you come where people cussing mom and, and all that stuff. <laughs> 
So we are asking you to keep this platform going. Let's help donate the numbers here. They take Zelle, Cash App, checks. Everything is here. And, and if you are sending money to Liberia, we have a, a company that, that helps us out. And we need to help them out too. Uh, Kana Cash. If you are sending money, they are fast, they are reliable, they've been in business for a while, we can vouch for them, use them. Uh, the more you, you do business with them, the more they will be able to benefit us, uh, to, uh, to endow them, then they will endow us. So everybody can have access to this history channel, what this woman is doing. I am telling you, it takes a lot of work. She has her own family. She has her own children. But she spent two hours sitting here educating me <laughs> as a pastor. Things that I didn't know about the pastor. I say she, 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 she's the queen of it. And I want, I want, I want to thank you very much. It. And as we come to a close, Mr. Jabari, you are young. And, and it's encouraging to see young yeah. people like you, okay, uh, picking up the mentor and running with it. So we have yes. a, we have yes. a <laughs> you are going to pollinate other young folks and listen, come and learn about our history. And yes. this, is, this is all about we want to thank you. So uh yes, oh we'll turn it back to you. I just I, I thank you for uh recognizing uh Jabari, of course, and other members of the history guild, um James Kuhn, AMA Cassell, uh Say, um, all of you who uh help <laughs> a lot and contribute and, and give ideas. I say and her uncle uh, helped with the language aspect of it and the, the identifying the names. They did a tremendously awesome job. And then um, uh, AMA, of course, Jabari is, is one of our, our primary researchers, but I just want to shout out the Librarian History Guild and thanks everyone for your support and your continuing interest in, in uh, resurrecting our forgotten history. Um, this is amnesia that can be cured. This is not permanent. We can, we can, we can resurrect our memory and pass it on. Um, even if it wasn't you know, intentionally passed on to us, it was, things were written down. And so um, this ends this, this episode. There's a lot more that we have to share. I'm gonna, think about doing a part two, just so we can take it all the way to 1821, as I had intended. Um, there's much more to discuss there as well. So uh, next week though, we are going to be talking about <laughs> Charles D.B. King and his presidency. So every other Saturday, we do the, the Librarian Presidential Series, um, Charles D.B. King being our first, uh, um, what, what we call, uh, Congo or descendant of recaptured Africans who um, was, uh, whose ancestors were all born on the mm -hmm. African continent. He was the first um, uh, uh, president of, of who was fully a recaptured African. Uh, we did have a Basa president before him, but he's a, the first president who's a recaptured African. Uh, this, uh, his parents were recaptured Africans. So this is very, very, very um, going to be a good episode. I'm sorry, I'm tired and slurring a bit. Um, so please tune in next week um, uh, for Charles D.B. King and Jabari's favorite president. Oh, it's going <laughs> to be a good one. I'm about to go in on him. That's going to be a good one. <laughs> Jabari's favorite president. Jabari's going to be very respectful to the memory of Charles D.B. King. But we're going to go through to his presidency and, and some of the mistakes he made and um, why he was impeached and all of those things. So we're gonna go into that next week, please tune in. And then the following week, uh, we will probably continue this and then add a bit more context. So thank you for being patient. Um, I don't know, I can't see if there's comments or questions, but I appreciate your time. Yeah, uh, next yeah. week, we're gonna, next week, excuse me, Jamar, next week, we're gonna do all we can to leave time for your comments and yeah. for uh, for your calls, but I, I want to I want to admonish you and I want to encourage you that Charles D. B. King, we are going to be talking about uh, the King family. They are alive and well in Liberia. In fact, I, I, will, I, I think our immediate past Secretary of State in the Ellen government, Banky King, 
That's the granddaughter of Charles D.B. King. So Minister of Foreign Affairs. Yes, the uh, Foreign Affairs. You know, uh, yeah. back then we played yeah. But she was she, she was she was minister of foreign affairs. The second yes. they changed it during Talbert's time. She was I just want to clarify she was minister of foreign affairs. So minister of foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. So they, these people are here. Uh this is not some ancient history. Their children, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren are here and they are active and they are still giving back to our country in different ways through public service. Whether yes. you like them, you are a fan or not, they are serving and they are serving well. And I, I was able to meet her when she was when she was foreign minister. Great woman. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, next week should be fun. Charles D.B. King and the Bassa people have a special story about the King, Charles D.B. King, when he was president, because they felt that it was the hardest time in Liberian history. Times were so tough. They will tell you, Bassa Mel will tell you, Charlie King team said. He said, all of my trouble was Charlie King time. So the believe <laughs> Charles King and she and, and Cole is going to elaborate on the good and the bad and the indifferent, not just the bad, but everything else in between. So you need to tune in to, uh, on next weekend. It's going to be fun. I'm going to be tuned in. So should you. Jabari, close her out. Yeah, so I, I really want to hone this in on by saying that when we look at history and we look back, we have to understand of looking at stuff through a objective and complete lens and not trying to project our insecurities, our ideology on history. Because a lot of times we see it, oh, why are you speaking on this tribe and trying to project on this ethnic group, this ethnic group, instead of saying, listen, Basa history is my history. Pele history is my history. African American history is Liberian history. All of our history is ours. And we have to embrace all of it. We have to get out this mind. We have to get out of the box. So many of us have a mindset of looking at our history in a box. And we are un we feel uncomfortable trying to get outside that box. Right. And once we understand that we get outside of that box and we look at it through a new lens and look at it through a complete and holistic lens is when you start seeing that we have a great history. Yes. I saw you have the Peters. There's so much that we have that we have to appreciate, but we have to look at it outside of the box and not through a lens of projection. We mm -hmm. don't need to be projecting our ethnic hatred or whatever biases you have onto history. All of our history is ours. Everybody Liberian history is a reflection of us. I, I yeah. will rep Bondi, I will rep Cloud, even if <laughs> I'm not from there, because it's a win is a win, not focusing strictly on my people, because I'm your people, you're my people. We all are our people, and we exactly. have to start to understand that. And the thank funny you. thing, I always thank you, Jabari. I love that. It's funny because who you are today might not have been who your great great grandmother was yesterday. <laughs> so ethnicity is fluid, and we are all Liberian. Jerome, thank you. You did a great, great job. In fact, I'm glad it was you. And not Dennis today, just because of the language, <laughs> the language introduction, and you made it fun. So thanks for your help, and thanks for stepping in for Dennis. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, thank, thank you thank very you. much for what you do. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, they focused on other people sold that land for small fee. We didn't know that we were kings. That has made us to understand that. And Jabari, you talk about a box. I will close by what uh, uh, Dr. P. L. O. say. Say. Let us not be in the box. Let's get rid of the box totally. So we're not just going to do outside the box. We're going to, she just destroyed our box, and we are now <laughs> out of the box. And as usual, when we end our show, we end our show with our song that says, We are all Abira. See you next week. We all Abira. Abira is our own. Abira people. He is the Ah! Uh -huh.